Here's the example problem we started in discussion. The student is welding on the tang of a clevis, is welding the tang onto a frame for the strawberry hoop house remover. And uh, the cylinder has a, a clevis, so it's going to go on either side of this tang here. And the tang is what's being welded onto the frame. And what we want to do is analyze the fillet welds that are being used to attach the tang to the, the frame. Keeping in mind that the hydraulic cylinder is going to push and with a lot of force, and we need to make sure that regardless of the direction that it's pushing in, that we're safe. So we're not going to make any assumptions about the geometry here to determine what force, uh, what angle the force is going to act on. We're just going to assume that this force can act at some arbitrary angle. The Cylinder's hydro pressure is 2,000 psi and the bore is one and a half inches. So we're going to use that information to get the force. And we know that the base material of our part and the frame, so the tang and the frame, are both AZ1018, cold drawn steel. The ultimate tensile strength of that steel in the cold drawn condition is 64 psi and the yield strength is 54 psi. But here's the geometry. Uh, we don't care too much about these outer dimensions of the part. We're just analyzing the connection of the joint. Yeah, of course, you should also analyze the part itself. But we're analyzing the weld and the weld interface with the base metal right now. We've got a fillet weld that's got a quarter inch leg size. And it's two inches long and it's on both sides of the part. So on the side that we see and on the far side. So the arrow side and the reverse side, the other side. The thickness of the material is also a quarter of an inch. And we have got three questions. Is the joint, the weld, and the attachment, are they safe? What are the factors of safety for the weld and the attachment? And when is this analysis that we're doing valid? So we've only learned so far how to handle parallel and transverse stresses, not moment and torsional stresses on fillet welds. So we're going to assume uh, we're going to make a certain assumption, and I'll tell you what that assumption is after we do it. We're going to consider that a little bit more carefully. Okay, so let's just proceed somewhat blindly without thinking about whether the analysis is valid and think about is the attachment safe. Now for fillet welds, we've said that it doesn't really matter what direction you're pushing in, whether it is a, a shear, shearing sort of action. So let's say that you know, normally when we have a, a, a plane or something and we're analyzing the stresses on this plane, we look at the normal to it and we look at the direction of the applied load. And we say, all right, well, is the surface normal in the same direction as the applied load? Okay, then we're going to have a normal stress. Is the applied load, here's our force, here's our area, are these perpendicular? Okay, then we're going to have something like a shear stress. So, when we're analyzing fillet welds, we basically don't think about the direction of the applied load, and we just consider it to be a shear stress. And it doesn't really make sense. It's just the way that the analysis is done because it's conservative and because it works in practice. So what we're going to say is that this force, it doesn't really matter whether it's acting upwards or into or down or out or what some angle in between we're going to assume that it creates a shear stress in the weld that is the magnitude of the force divided by the total throat area of the weld. So our shear stress in the weld is equal to the force F divided by the total area of the weld. So let's figure out what those two things are. The force that we're talking about, we've got the pressure of the hydraulic cylinder times the uh, area of the bore. That's the pressure of the cylinder times pi times d squared over 4, where the diameter of the bore, that's 1.5 inches, and this is 2,000 psi. So our units are consistent. What we're going to get here is 3,534.3 psi, or uh, pounds, excuse me. That's the force of the cylinder. And the area, let's see, what's the area of the weld? It's different from the area of the cylinder bore, right? The weld area, well, let's think about that. We've got two welds, one on either side, so I'll start with a factor of two, and then we'll take a look at each of those welds separately. 
The area of the weld is 2 times the area of a fillet weld is its length times the leg size times a factor of root 2 over 2, or 0 0.707. So 0 0.707 times its length times the leg size that we call h. And this root 2 over 2 comes from the fact that while a fillet weld from the side looks something like a right triangle, and here is h, that's the leg size, and the length is into or out of the page. But when we shear the weld, when we consider the shear stress in the weld, we're pretending it's acting along the smallest possible cross-sectional area that's going to split the two parts. One and two are the two parts that we're attaching together with this weld. It's going to split the two parts in two, and this is the minimum cross-sectional area that could do that. You know, you could choose this one, you could choose this one, but all of those have greater cross-sectional areas than the throat, and the relationship between the throat, T, and the h here is a factor of 0.707. t is equal to 0 0.707, or root 2 over 2 times h, just by geometry. And so that's where this 0.707 comes from. We just need to multiply by the length into or out of the page, and we get the area, and that's where this all comes from. All right, so let's find our total area. We've got the length of it is 2 inches. That was coming from here, and this is the leg size, 1 quarter. So this turns out to be really easy. We've got a 2 times a 2, that's 4, times 1 quarter, that's a 1, so we're left with the 0 0.707. And that is in inches squared. All right, so next is finding out what this shear stress then is. Tau is F over area of the weld. So we've got 3,534.3 divided by 0 0.707. That turns out to be 4,998.2. And I think it's a coincidence that it turns out to be so close to 5,000. That is stress, so that's in units of PSI, because we kept all of our dimensions consistent. This was inches squared, and this was pounds, so PSI. So that's the shear stress inside the weld. And again, we're pretending it's a shear stress that acts uh, on the throat area regardless of the direction that this force is applied in. So let's find out whether that's acceptable or not. So we say, is the shear stress of the, in the weld, is that less than or equal to 0 0.3 times the ultimate tensile strength of the weld material? Now we're using an electrode that is an E6010. So electrode 6010, the 60 tells us the approximate ultimate strength of the weld material. It turns out that if you look in the book, SUT, the ultimate tensile strength, is actually 62 for uh, a 6010 electrode. So we're going to use the 62, a little bit more careful. T on the weld, this was about 5 KSI from here, 4.99. And 0.3 times the 62 is 18.6 KSI. And yeah, 5 KSI is less than 18.6 KSI, so the weld itself is safe. All right, now let's analyze the attachment. Is the attachment safe? Well, we've got two different places where we have an attachment. We should analyze both of them. The first one is where does the filler attach to the base metal here, and then where does the filler attach to the tang itself here? Now, when we're analyzing the attachment, we do need to consider whether it is a shear stress or a normal stress. So let's look at it from this view. It depends on what direction that this force is acting. So let's pretend for a second that this force is acting purely normal to the surface of the frame itself. Okay, so straight in this direction. Maybe we should give ourselves a coordinate system to work with. So if that's the case, then the attachment between the weld and this surface here is going to have an area that is in the same direction. It's going to be the normal of the surface is in the same direction as the force. So the attachment, so let's just say, so if the force is normal to frame surface, we're going to end up with a normal stress on the attachment to the frame. Now, there's 
an attachment between the fillet weld and the tang itself, so the attachment between the fillet weld and the tang, well, the normal of the tang is coming out at us, and that is perpendicular to the applied force. So when we look at the attachment between the filler metal and the tang, we're going to have a shear force, a shear stress. Now let's consider the case where the force is perpendicular to that, if the force was in the y direction instead. So if the force is in this direction, well, the attachment between the filler metal and the surface of the frame here, the surface normal of the frame is out in this direction, horizontal, and this vertical force that's applied here, well, those are perpendicular. So that's going to be a shear stress. So if the force is in the y direction, we could look at it as a shear stress on the attachment to the frame because the forces are now perpendicular to each other. Now, how about the attachment with the tang? Well, the weld material is attached to the tang on some area here, just like before, and the surface normal is out at us. That's still perpendicular to the applied force, so we still have a shear force or a shear stress we will have a shear stress on the attachment to the tank. So what we're going to do, you know, we could have some intermediate angle in between, and it doesn't really tell you how you should analyze that. We could say that maybe what we should do is calculate the worst case von Mises stress, sigma prime, and make that less than or equal to 0 0.6 times the yield strength of the base metal material. We could do that. We're not going to do that today. We're just going to analyze the two cases separately. And I think that's going to give us a pretty good idea of whether this thing is safe or not. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the stress on the, the attachment to the frame surface when the load is acting in the x direction. So we've got a normal stress on the attachment to the frame that is the force divided by the area. Now what's our area in this case? It is the area of the attachment between the filler metal and the frame. This is the sort of from the side, that, the patch that we're looking at. And it's got a length of two inches, and the leg size of the fillet is one quarter. So it's just on either side, it's two inches times one quarter. And we've got, so the area here is the length of the weld times the leg size of the weld, and we've got two of them. We don't have a factor of 0.707 because we're not talking about the throat. We're talking about right on the leg of the weld. And the force is the same force that we've been talking about, which is, what, 3,534. And what we're supposed to compare that to, because we're talking about the base metal, is that less than or equal to 0 0.6 times the yield strength of the base metal. Now, the yield strength of the base metal, I gave you 54 KSI for AZ1018 cold drawn. Is that okay to use? No, it's not, because you need to look and see what the hot rolled properties are, because the weld can undo any cold work that's been done on the part, any additional treatment has been done on the material. We just need to rely on the chemistry of the material and assume that in the heat affected zone, it returns to its annealed properties. So the hot rolled yield strength of the part is 32 KSI. So let's check that out. 0 0.6 times 32 is equal to 19.2 KSI. And sure, uh, 3.5 KSI is less than 19.2. We're okay here. Let's analyze the shear stress on the attachment to the tang in this case. Well, the shear stress, tau, is also equal to F over, it's actually the same area because we're talking now about the this red area here. We're pretending that the force is in the horizontal direction. And so we're talking about over this surface. This is the surface normal coming out at us. It is a shear stress because it's perpendicular to the applied force. And the area is just whatever this length is times the leg size of the weld, because it's going to be the same on this red face and on this pink face, just like we had before. And there's two of them. There's one on either side. So actually, we have the same magnitude of stress 
Well, we need to compare it to a different number. We need to make sure that's less than 0 0.4 times the yield strength of the material because that's the condition that we talked about last time and that's said in the book. So is that safe? So 0 0.4 times 32 is 12.8. Yeah, it's still safe. 12.8 KSI, we're still okay. Okay, so we've handled these two conditions. We've handled the force acting in the x direction on both sides. Now we would want to handle the other case when the force is acting in the y direction. And we're going to get a good idea that it's safe everywhere. So actually, we don't have to do any new calculations for this one. Now we've got the same force. It's just we're interpreting it as being a shear stress on the attachment to the frame. That's the only thing that changed. It was still a shear stress in the attachment to the tang, and so we already did that. But the materials are the same, so we've already done the calculation. Um, we've, we've checked, and this is the worst case, is when we have to compare the, sh the shear stress in the base metal to the maximum allowable shear stress. Now let's calculate what those factors of safety are. Just a quick apology about the upcoming change in audio quality. Not sure what happened. The uh, screen recording software decided to change how it was recording the sound. So the first factor of safety we'll calculate is the factor of safety on the attachment. And specifically, we'll look at the attachment between the fillet weld, the filler material, and the frame itself, this pink area. And we'll look at it for the case when the force is in the x direction. So it's this first case here. F is normal to the frame surface in the x direction, and we have a normal stress on the attachment to the frame. And we checked that it was safe by checking whether sigma, F over A, was less than or equal to 0 0.6 times SY. So to calculate our factor of safety, you might be tempted to say N times R sigma is equal to 0 0.6 times SY. And I'm going to tell you not to do that. This here is not a failure stress. This is an allowable stress that is recommended by Shigley's textbook, and it references the American Welding Society and AISC codes for welding. It's found here in this table. Even though it says it's for butt welds, it's also they also apply it in example problem in the textbook to the base metal and the attachment with the base metal. They say for simple compression and tension, 0, uh, 0 0.6 SY is the permissible stress, but that already has a factor of safety of 1.67 built in. So we don't want to use this. This is not a failure strength. This 0.6 comes from 1 divided by 1.67. 1 divided by 1.67 is 0.598. That's where this 0.6 comes from, is they've divided the yield strength by the factor of safety and they got this 0.6. So you wouldn't want to include a factor of safety on top of a factor of safety. You wouldn't want to say, my factor of safety, I should define it as n times sigma is equal to sy over a factor of safety, right? That, that wouldn't make sense to include a second factor of safety. So that's not what we're going to do. We're going to just say our factor of safety is how many times we can increase our stress without exceeding the yield strength of the material. Here we have n is equal to sy divided by sigma. And our sy for this material is 32 ksi. And the stress that we had was 3534 psi in that attachment. And so our factor of safety is around 9, 9.05. That is our factor of safety for, for this case when we have uh, the force is normal to the frame surface and we're calculating the factor of safety for the attachment to the frame. Now let's take a look at when the force is normal to the frame surface, but we're looking at the shear stress on the attachment to the tang now. All right, so again, you say, well, what is the factor of safety on our shear stress? You might say n times tau, the shear stress we have. What's the maximum n we can have such that we don't exceed 0.4? times the yield strength, right? But this 0.4 times the yield strength, that came from here. Shear stress on the base metal should not exceed 0.4. It explains in the chapter, but that's coming from this. And that's a little bit confusing. So this, this one's a little bit more understandable. 
but this one is maybe a little bit confusing. So let's see where that's coming from. And they say using the distortion energy theory as the criterion of failure. So what they've really started with, as they said, is N times the von Mises stress is equal to SY. That's what they started with. And they said, we want to, we're going to, we're going to apply a factor of safety, as it turns out, of N is equal to 1.44. That's what they ended up using. They, and they said, okay, well, what's the von Mises stress when we have a pure shear stress? So if we're in the case where we have none of this, we have none of this, no normal stress, we only have a pure shear. That's our tau here. Okay, what does our distortion energy, our von Mises stress, look like? The von Mises stress in that case is, well, sigma x is zero. So that's zero as well. Sigma y is zero. And we're left with three tau xy. Tau xy in this case, we're just calling tau. Okay, so the von Mises stress is the square root of three times tau squared is root three times tau. So how many times could we increase root three times tau without exceeding the shear stress? How many times could we increase tau without exceeding the yield stress divided by root three. What's SY divided by root three? It's 0.577, that's where that's coming from. So we end up with how many times could we increase the shear stress without exceeding 0 0.577 times SY? And they said, well, we're gonna use a factor of safety as N is equal to 1.44. This is what they said the factor of safety was. All right, let's calculate what that turns out to be. Tau is equal to 0 0.577 over 1.44 SY. That is equal to 0 0.4 times SY. So that's where it comes from. That's where the 0 0.4 comes from. So we don't want, that, that, that's really taking, if we were to say, well, we want to figure out our factor of safety by saying, how many times could we increase tau without exceeding 0 0.4 times SY? Well, that's the same as, the 0 0.577 that's coming from the distortion energy theory divided by a factor of safety already. We don't want to include two factors of safety. We don't want a factor of safety on top of that factor of safety. So we really just want to say, how many times could we increase tau without exceeding 0.577 times the yield strength? Or how many times could we increase our von Mises stress without exceeding the yield strength? That is what this is a statement of. So in order to calculate our factor of safety, we say 0 0.577 SY over the tau that we are experiencing, 0 0.577 times the yield strength of 32 over our tau, which is 5.22. So our factor of safety on the shear stress on the attachment to the tang when the force is normal to the frame surface is only about 5.22. But that's really quite high already. It's definitely more than the required 1.44. So it's still safe. And then if we wanted to calculate the factor of safeties for all of these situations, well, I think they're gonna end up being the same thing. They're all shear stresses on the attachments to the frame. We've got the same material everywhere, so we use the same y every, SY everywhere, and the areas that we're talking about are the same here, and the force is all the same. So it turns out that this is our... Finally, we want to figure out what the factor of safety is on the weld. And the normal criterion for welds, checking whether they're safe, is we check whether for a fillet weld, is our tau less than or equal to 0 0.3 times ultimate tensile strength. Unfortunately, the book doesn't really tell us where this comes from. It doesn't say that there is a factor of safety that's associated with this. Uh, it doesn't say what fi failure criterion they're using. You know, for the everything else, they're assuming that there is the yield of some sort is going on. The distortion energy theory is the criterion of failure. But once they put an ultimate tensile strength there, that's not yield is not what they're comparing to. They're comparing to ultimate failure of the material. So we don't really have a theory. I can't like write down, you know, what factor of safety this corresponds with. I can't say, well, that means that 
they started with sigma prime is equal to n times sigma prime is equal to the ultimate tensile strength, that doesn't make any sense and figure out the factor of safety from there because sigma prime only relates to yield. There's nothing. There's not a special relationship between sigma prime and the ultimate tensile strength. You can't do that. This wouldn't be a really valid equation because of what sigma prime comes from. The theory concerning sigma prime is about yield. It's not about the ultimate failure of the material. You can't just apply it uh, and assume that there's any meaning if the sigma prime is equal to the ultimate tensile strength, therefore it will fracture. That's not the case. This is not a valid equation. The sigma prime is only useful when you're comparing it to the yield strength. This is when yield were a cutter. That's what the distortion energy theory says. It does not, cannot be extended to say this. So I can't tell you where this comes from and therefore I can't really uh, define a factor of safety for that. I won't typically ask you to calculate the factor of safety on a weld. I might ask you to tell me what the shear strength in the fillet weld material is. I might ask you to tell me whether it's safe or compare it to this allowable stress inside the weld, but I won't ask you to calculate a factor of safety because it's not a really well-defined thing. We can come up with our con a convention for it, but Shigley doesn't give a, a suggestion for, for how to do so. All right, so the final part of the problem is when is this analysis valid? So we've checked for only two cases of this load. Is it pointing straight in or out, you know, in the x direction or in the y direction? So we haven't actually shown that it's okay at intermediate loads, any immediate angles between those two. For the weld material, since we're always supposed to analyze the stresses as shear stresses, uh, I guess it doesn't really matter what direction the force is in, and our analysis is, is valid for any of these directions. So I suppose we have, for the weld material, shown that it's okay for any direction. Now for the attachment, the only things that we know how to analyze are pure shear and pure tension or compression. We don't know how to analyze between those. Now we could say, what is our factor of safety for sigma prime, how many times could we increase sigma prime without exceeding the yield strength of the material? And think about, for all possible angles, what is sigma prime going to be? We can calculate a shear stress, we can calculate a normal stress, we'll plug those things into our equation here, for sigma prime is equal to the square root of all this stuff, and we'll figure out what our factor of safety is in all those cases, and we'll figure out the worst case. I'm pretty sure, I haven't done the calculation, but I think it's going to turn out that it's when the shear stress, when it's pure shear, that we're going to get the worst case. And, uh, and then we'd find our, our uh, worst case factor of safety, and I think that we'd find that uh, this is actually uh, still, a, this is a good factor of safety regardless of what the load direction is. Now there's another thing that we haven't considered besides this, the direction of the load, and that's the fact that the load, we've so far kind of been assuming that it passes through the centroid of the weld. If we look at this all from the right side, if we are looking at it from over here, and we draw what it looks like, we have the tang in the middle, and then we've got the fillet welds that are next to it. What we've kind of implicitly been assuming is that whatever the force is, it's going to go through the centroid of the weld. If it's a force into or out of the page, it's going through this point. If it's a shear force, it's going, you know, directly through that point. We haven't thought about the fact that when we apply a force, say, downwards, so this is fine, this actually goes through the centroid of the weld, but what if the force were turned at an angle? You know, what if the force looks like this? Well, then that arrow is kind of pointing towards down here. That's going to tend, that's going to do two things. It's going to have a shear force. Here's a shear component downwards, but it's also going to tend to peel this top away from the wall. There's a bending moment as well that we need to consider on this weld that's going to try to pull on the top, and it's also going to kind of push on the bottom. So we haven't considered that. That's the topic for next time, learning how to analyze welds under bending moments and torsion. But because this distance here between the weld and the point of application of load is rather small, 
I don't think that those are going to be very substantial. I don't think we're losing much in the analysis. Um, it's not conservative what we've done, um, but maybe we'll revisit this problem and take a look at it when we consider those effects.